Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kent Yu. He's a registered uh, civil engineer and a structural engineer. He's a principal and branch manager of Dagan Cope Engineers, a consulting firm in Portland. Uh, he received his doctorate in structural engineering from the University of California, San Diego, and he's worked on projects with all different kinds of construction types, including seismic evaluation, retrofit design of existing buildings, condition assessments, uh, historic preservations, and, and so on and so forth. He's, uh, uh, he's published over t uh, 30 technical publications, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps one of the highlights is that he uh, was a recipient of ASE uh, Raymond Reese Research Prize, which is a, a very highly prestigious prize for research uh, as a recognition of his outstanding research contribution to structural engineering. Uh, he's a member of the Oregon Seismic Safety Policy Advisory Commission, which is appointed by the governor. Um, and uh, he actually represents the structural engineers. Uh, he has also been um, selected to be uh, one of the top 40 engineers under 40. They've got to be under 40 before you qualify. Uh, and it's called 40 Under 40 um, by the Building Design and Construction, also the Consulting Specifying Engineers. Uh, he's conducted numer numerous uh, earthquake reconnaissance uh, projects and reports, including the one in Peru, uh, China, and uh, Chile. So without any further ado, Dr. Kent Yu. Thank you. I'm a structural engineer, but my topic is a, a social science topic. It's kind of funny. Uh, you know, it's, uh, in, my, in my career, the, the, there are two important uh, people actually uh, uh, inspired me uh, got into this business. One is my friend, uh, Yume Wan, and I got to know her uh, about uh, four or five years ago when I moved from California to here, and she encouraged me to join OSPAC. She believed that uh, seismic policy will brought a much broader impact to the society. The second person is our former CEO, Chris Poland. And today, actually, I will borrow some of the, his ideas uh, into this presentation. The, uh, with all the uh, uh, former speakers, uh, and plus the, uh, Brian's uh, excellent topic about uh, the emergency response, I, I think this is a set of wonderful stage for me to sort of uh, wrap up this uh, symposium. So the, you know, we live in uh, Portland, and you know, we believe our, our city is very healthy. When you think about a healthy uh, city, you're thinking about uh, you know, um, a vibrant e economy. You know, Portland State University is one of the largest employers in the region, certainly it's doing its part. And we have, we are, you know, uh, University of Portland and the city of Portland as a region, we exercise sustainability. We enjoy our wonderful urban planning. But one thing what I want to talk about is we are lacking here is resilience planning. So how we learned you know, resilience planning from, you know, we learned those things from the past earthquakes. We learned from our mistakes. Um, in 1906, San, Fran San Francisco earthquake, a lot of buildings collapsed uh, and followed by a major fire. So we learned, our major, our, as an engineer, our major responsibility is bring life safety to the people. It's about you, people. And uh, in the following 40 years, we, uh, we experienced other earthquakes, you know, 1933 Long Beach earthquake and 1940 uh, El Centro earthquake. In 1933 Long Beach earthquake, we understand it is important to make our schools safe. Okay? In, in California, they, uh, they established a new department at GSA to make sure all the school buildings will be safely designed. Then we move on to 1971 San Fernando earthquake. In that earthquake, other than the bridge collapse uh, Pete Dusica was talking about, we also talk about the hospitals. We want to have a safe hospitals because, after all, first of all, hospital has to take care of the patients already in the building, and also they have to take care of the patients that got injured during the earthquake. Uh, this one showed that this hospital was, uh, was uh, several months old. Uh, then the, the, the hospital collapsed. This is the Olive Hospital. And we learned a big lesson from this earthquake. After this earthquake, we, uh, we spent a lot of energy and, and resource together, de developing our modern seismic code. This is a milestone earthquake for, for U.S. seismic code development. 
Caltrans uh, uh, started to realize their problems, and they didn't do a whole lot until 1987-88. Uh, they wanted to do something, then 1989 Loma Prieta hit. Well, not only caused the uh, uh, major lifeline uh, damage uh, on, the you know, on the Oakland side, but also on the uh, Transmay uh, uh, route. This is the San Francisco Bay Bridge collapsed. So from that, we understand that the importance of lifeline it could have brought a huge impact on the regional economy, regional response, and regional recovery. And also, as part of that, we, some of the buildings, you can see that the soft story building at the bottom, it did not collapse. Uh, people m might be able to get out of the building safely. You know? We sort of meet our life safety uh, performance. But the thing is, after earthquake, where, where can we put all these people? We've got to think about that. Then 1994, Northridge came along. This is a five year, four or five years after uh, Caltrans uh, started their seismic retrofit program. Uh, the, the bridge on the uh, upper left shows the wonderful performance of a uh, retrofitted bridge. Well, they also have some uh, bridge didn't perform so well because they didn't retrofit it. And also, in, from this earthquake, we have a, a few collapsed buildings. Generally, the building perform okay. We, we generally meet our life safety performance standards. When, we say, when I say life safety performance standards, means people can get out of the building safely on your own. Okay? Um, this is the second building we worked on. Um, this is the uh, uh, building. Uh, building overall is safe. Overall is fine, life safe, but we have uh, some structural damage in the building. And more importantly, the building uh, suffered extensive non structural damage. Now, what you have a building is still standing, uh, needs some repair work, but, uh, the, the, uh, but the, uh, uh, the, the amount of uh, non structural damage is so extensive, essentially, this building is useless. Some of the, so, so after this earthquake, we start thinking about non-structural performance. Okay. And from that earthquake, also, we found that there's lots of problems with the so-called non-ductile concrete frame building. These, these buildings typically designed before 1971, San Fernando earthquake. We have a lot of these kind of buildings in Poland. Uh, recently, you know, uh, the Pacific Northwest in 2001 had an Esquali earthquake. Well, you know, it's, uh, we have a, a state legislative building uh, had a damage. And also, you know, no, no, not a surprise, a lot of unreinforced masonry building damage. Okay? Those buildings are, when I talk about unreinforced masonry buildings, and previously the non-ductile, the pre-1971, uh, uh, the concrete frame buildings, those buildings are killer buildings. They'll kill people. So now, th this is the progression we learned over the years. Okay? Now, how much damage, how much punch, you know, you think about this one. Earthquake is like, you know, like a, a, a heavyweight boxer. It hits you, it hits you so hard, and whether you're going to knock out or whether you just, you know, dust off and stand up and walk away. Think about this. So th this is about re resilience. Haiti, Haiti is happening in 2000, uh, 2010, they had an earthquake. What's their problem? Well, clearly, I would say one, one light punch, they're knocked out. That's, that's not good model for us. From Katrina, we learned a wonderful lesson. We need to keep our people in place. We need to have government in place so that we can recover. Without that, it's impossible to talk about uh, uh, recover and rebuild. Chile earthquake. Chile is, they have similar building codes. They have a similar geological setting to Oregon, to Washington. And they, over the past 30 or 40 years, as, as Franz mentioned that, they had so many earthquakes. So they, they are able to build their community much more resilient than us, okay? So that's, that's our target, that's our goal. And New Zealand in 2011. New Zealand in 2011, their, in my mind, their resilience is similar to ours. In New Zealand, they, tend to, they used to focus on the, uh, the seismic, seismic retrofit, their attention to Wellington and other places. They never thought about it as big seismic hazard on the Christchurch, okay? Now, they have lots of unreinforced masonry buildings. They have lots of non-ductile concrete frame buildings in their downtown area. And so they, they you know, they, they have earthquake awareness. They, they are, you know, over the years, they are retrofitting all these killer buildings. But this one hit them real hard. What happened after earthquake? They shut down the entire central business district. 6,000 companies, 50,000 people, they cannot get into the central business district to work. That's going to kill their city. So, before I 
talk about uh, resilience planning, I want to talk about uh, seismic performance levels. You know, traditionally, structural engineers, we didn't do well explain to public, did not explain to the building owners, uh, emergency planners, uh, what building performance means. When, when, when we talk about this code compliant building, what does that mean? You're thinking about a damage proof building, right? Not, not much so. When we, when we design buildings, we look at a building depending on their categories, okay? If we're design, we designing hospitals, we're thinking about operational performance at the very top, okay? For, for when we design typical uh, university buildings have lots of people, we're thinking about maybe immediate occupancy performance. For your regular office building, for your home, we're thinking about life safety. And some of the, and, and then when we look at the deal with the, some of the, in older buildings, when we retrofit these buildings, oftentimes the target that we're using is near collapse. Okay, make sure the building is is leaning, and almost losing its lateral capacity, but it's still standing. Collapse is something we want to avoid. I want to give you a few examples. First one shows the uh, operational performance. That's a hospital uh, in Los Angeles, and building did wonderfully well, and essentially is before the actual earthquake. There is no difference. That is the operational performance well. Second performance is immediate occupancy. You will see some of the elements have yielded already. You can see the, you have this, uh, the brace frame, there's a top portion. Top portion is because they have mill scale. It's very brittle. When, when the steel started to yield and work and the, the mill scale popped off, so what you see is the natural color of steel. But people may get scared of it. The engineer will tell you this building is fine. You can use this building, okay? Next building is life safety. Building. This is from Alaska earthquake. The building have, has lost extensive, has experienced a uh, tremendous amount of cracking. The building may be leaning a little bit, and certainly this building <coughs> needs to um, meet life safety. You can get out of the building safely by on your own, but this building may need a tremendous amount of repair work before you can move in. That's the life, what the life safety means. It means that your own, your office building, that's the performance by the design. And this is a collapse provision. The building is on the verge of collapse, and you may need a rescue, uh, uh, rescuer to get you out of the building. Certainly, you're going to lose all of your, all, all of your belongings. That's the piece I, is I, I took from a China earthquake. Everything stands on ground. This is collapse. Now, talk about resilient city. Resilient city, as I mentioned, that you know, the, it's uh, should the city or, or even a community like a Portland University as, as, as an entity, and you take the punch out from a disaster, and you can recover and respond quickly. That's, that's what a resilience is all about, okay? So the, when we talk about resilience, we, we, look, we are thinking about two things, mostly. One is you, the people. Second is the economy. Think about this, Portland University. If, you, if your building collapsed, if your building is on the verge of collapse, no professor cannot come to the classroom to teach class. Students are worried about their own safety. What's going to happen? That's going to kill your university. That's not really it. So you have to make sure that part of your structure to protect their people. And then once you protect the people, you can attract a student to your university. You can help your you continue to stimulate the economy and, and, and help the community move forward. Okay? So and the other thing is also we believe the resilience is also sustainable. Think about this thing. If you build a, a building, when you build a new building, it, it doesn't cost so that much actually to make the building just a little better. It doesn't cost that much. The most cost of the thing is the retrofit. Afterthought. I didn't do the, the building was under design, you come back, then you retrofit, that's costly. But when you do the new design, it doesn't cost that much. Think about this thing. If, you, if this building performs really well, only experience very little damage, you can use this building right afterwards. Versus the building is on the verge of collapse, and you have to tear down. When you tear down a building, what's going to happen? You, 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 you have to create a lot of a construction waste. And also, you destroy all the, all the energy in the original building. Now you need a, Burden the society to, to, to buy more construction material, which will generate a lot more carbon prints. So we feel that if you build a, your community resilient, then you can actually reduce you can reduce future carbon prints and make make everybody make your future make the next generation future generations uh, in a better position. So the uh, our CEO uh, in San Francisco, he he worked with San Francisco City um, uh, in the 100th centennium of. of uh, uh, of the San Francisco earthquake, they, they were trying to look at how can they make this San Francisco uh, more resilient. So I want to take some of the ideas and tie it together with our 
sort of local situation, and we can you know take a look at where we are and what, what you know what what should we do afterwards. So, in order to talk about uh, you know resilience, you know I Bryant did a very good job. He's talking about uh, uh, preparedness, uh, you know, response, recovery, and all that stuff. And the same thing with resilience. You need to think about the context of response and, and, and recovery. Well, you, you walk backwards. You say, what do I need in the first week of after earthquake? What do I need in the first month or two months after earthquake? What do I need in the, in the next three years after earthquake? You walk backwards and think about what's, what is most critical in, in your community so that you can be resilient. Okay? Think about that. The second piece is that we need to define the goals. What, uh, the, what type of goals we need to achieve in order to, in order to get a so-called resilience? Okay, when we, we, have, we need to have some measures also to, to, to say, well, we didn't meet that resilience goal or not. So we need to talk about all of these, and finally, so then we can talk about our recommendations. So the typically earthquake, uh, put in the post post -earth earthquake period, we have uh, three stages. First stage is the uh, first uh, first week or so. First week, that's the initial response, and you know, and it's staging for reconstruction. So in this time period, of time, what's going to happen is this: you know, your emergency, the hospital, your emergency uh, rescue, and uh, and fire station, police station, all will respond to the event. Okay, and and hopefully during that time, most of the people can stay in the house, right? And hopefully, the uh, most of the uh, utility and transporting are still still intact. That's kind of that's a, that, that's what we hope. In the, in, the, in the second stage, we want to uh, restore the workforce because we want to make sure that you can stay in your home because you like your home. You want to stay at home. If you stay at home, you come back work. So if if you move out of this region, that's going to bring down the entire economy in this area. I don't care whether you're a university or a small business or a large top 500 company. If you do have people working for you, you are toasted. And then. And the last piece is the is the long-term reconstruction. Okay, so there are three different stages. In, in those three stages, is the workforce and the critical lifeline. Critical life will, will support support us, all of us, you and I, uh, through and, and uh, through this uh, post-disaster event, and also bring us to the you know the uh, our normal life, right? So the and. When, you, when we talk about performance level, we need to talk about hazard. Well, what type of earthquake you're talking about, right? So, you know, there, there are several earthquakes. We, we are talking, in the tradition, we talk about small earthquake, moderate earthquake, and also the large earthquake, major earthquake. And, you know, typically for the planning purpose, normally, you know, if we use, we use the so-called expected earthquake, the second one, you know, is, that's the design event we normally shoot for. Uh, the earthquake happens um, every 500 years. Typically, we believe this type of earthquake, uh, you know, w w would occur once in in a, in, a, in the structure's, uh, you know, usable lifetime. So, now talking about the hazard, talking about performance goal, and talk about the, um, uh, talking about the. Then we need to talk about some measures. When we talk about performance, we, we need to start with talking about building performance. For the building performance, we can divide into into uh, <coughs> five categories. Five categories. The first category we know we know that is safe and operational. This is mostly uh, to deal with essential facilities such as hospitals, emergency response center, and fire station and police station. That's kind of stuff. Second category is current. We don't necessarily have uh, uh, for for the residential homes. We are hoping that there's a shelter in place residential uh, re residential buildings. This this type of uh, category is we, we on the, the performance we are looking at is safe and, and usable during repair. So building may have some cracking going on in your building, but the building is still usable. You can, you can stay, you can feel safe and use this building. Okay? And that's something we don't have right now. Previously, we talked about this. Typical when design residential homes, we are looking at is life safety. I don't guarantee you building is usable after event. And sometimes we use the uh, you know, safe and usable during repair as, the, as a performance target. For old buildings, uh, you know, we uh, built it 20 years ago. When we retrofit our building, it's sometimes very difficult to bring all the way to the operation level, but we just bring them to the uh, immediate, so called immediate occupancy performance level, or, or we call it uh, safe and usable during repair. And then category C 
is the you know, safe and usable after repair. Typically, if you design this building according to current code, you should be able to meet, meet, you should be able to meet this performance level. Some of the buildings, if you didn't, if you didn't design well or the builder didn't build it properly, then you can fall into the uh, this category D. Sometimes, sometimes when we do the voluntary seismic upgrade, also we use that uh, use that target. For example, if you have uh, unreinforced masonry buildings and you want to retrofit that, sometimes we follow that category. Use, use use this performance as uh, as our target. So, <clears throat> last piece is unsafe. Building is you know is uh, partially or completely collapsed, and you know, this is all we normally talk about killer buildings, these unreinforced, you know, unretrofitted unreinforced masonry buildings, or the uh, pre-1971, 74, you know, non-ductile concrete frame buildings. For the lifeline, we use different measures. We, we, use, we, use, we use different measures. We oftentimes use how many days we need to restore the, the, the service up to 90% level, 95% level, or 100% level. So there are three categories. You know, for the for the emergency for the emer for the uh, extremely critical lifeline, we want to make sure that they are with, they can they can go back to work within four hours, okay, within four hours. The second category is they, within 72 hours. We are hoping that they are going to back, be back bring back to service. The reason is Brian said you know we have we have 72 hour kit. After 72 hours, well, what are we going to do? We are hoping our utility is back, right? That's we, <clears throat> that, 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 that's what we want to shoot for. And within the next 30 days, we want to make sure that we have bring our utility to 95%. And, <clears throat> and within four months, is 100%. So the, 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 this applies not only for the, you know, both the utility and the transportation. Category three is resume similar to the category two, except the, some of the components, is, uh, they are so old, they are so uh, vulnerable, we just have to replace them. So then, um, you know, we, we it's going to take three years to take them up to 100% sort of uh, um, uh, for service level. So talking, now we, let's combine these uh, li lifeline buildings and also what we need after Im immediate after earthquake, what we need. So <clears throat> after earthquake, immediate after earthquake, we need to have, make sure emergency operations center is working. We need to make sure the hospital is working, fire station is working, police station is working. And also, we want to make sure that the city building is working so that we need to have government in place. Without government, with the, with, without a uh, commander in place, it's gonna, it, we're going to have some chaotic situation. And <clears throat> then also, some, some of the people will lose their homes during the earthquake. We need to have emergency shelters. Where, ask yourself, where is my emergency shelter? Okay, right now. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and also, we're hoping that is, after the, you know, we uh, in the Pacific Northwest that we have a lot of uh, wood residential homes, and typically they perform really well in the earthquake. But we are hoping that generally after earthquake, people feel concerned about their building safety. So we need to have engineers to inspect their building. Hopefully, we are, we are hoping that these buildings can be inspected within 72 hours. We don't have enough engineers resources in our state. We have to go to the neighboring state to help us, because our coast up and down. We cannot count on Washington to get the same building. For the lifeline. We want to make sure this essential service will, will up in, within four hours. Okay, think about this. I, I'm mostly I'm talking about the bridges, <clears throat> bridges, and also some um, and some of the uh, water systems too. So then we move to the second stage. Second stage, we need to install our workforce. Now, after seven days, you want to go back to work. Well, before you do go back to work, you need to think about where sh who, who's going to take care of my kids. Well, maybe some of you are old enough. Your kids already, you know, good, good. Uh, that they have uh, married, and you know, you have to worry about them. But the thing, but the thing, you have to think about what about my grandchildren? Who's going to take care of them? So, you, so then, <clears throat> if you, in order to go to work, you have to somebody take care of your your your, your kids. So, kids, I want to make sure that within, in the second stage, our schools will open. You can send your school to you can send your your kids to school, so that you can go, go to work. And also, uh, we are hoping that the doctor can go back to their medical office to, 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 y y if you don't feel well, right? And also, schools, your universities, you know, that's the goal. After disruption, within a month or so, after a month or so, you, you, you need to think about, we need to get people back to study. And then professors, other, we don't want to lose our professors. We don't want to lose our students, yeah? 
so the, uh, <coughs> so the, do, the we want to, you, during this phase, we want to make sure that 95%, 95% of the uh, service will be available. Now, in order for you to go to work, what you have to do? I need to drive my car, right? I need to take my public transportation. So I, I, I want to make sure all the lifeline will back to 95% now, more or less. If I don't have that, I cannot go back to work, I cannot go back to my normal life. <coughs> Last piece is some the industrial buildings, typically you know, they're old, they were not well built. Some, some of the historic buildings they were retrofit. Um, uh, you know, they went through the voluntary you know, retrofit, you know, they have to tear down some of the buildings. They are, they are certainly you know, old and, and, and dangerous. With. So the, those are the buildings we have teared them down with a rebuild. And some of the old uh, lifeline system in your, uh, in your community also needs to rebuild in that time. I want to start off with this slide. I, I took this slide from Peter Bishop's report. So, so the, the bridge we're talking about is, Peter mentioned that mo the, most of the bridge designed after 1990, 1994, probably will perform reasonably well, okay? And before that, those bridges are probably questionable, okay? I want to, you look at this regional map. Think about up and down I-5 corridor. Thinking about the 205 route. If we have a major earthquake, somebody wants to drive from California to help us. Well, they can go, go through the Boone Bridge in Wilsonville, and then they're gonna say, well, 205, should I go to 205? Abernathy Bridge, is that bridge safe? Well, if that bridge is down, I'm going to keep going forward up, going to Portland. Well, then we have a Markham Bridge. We have a 405 Bridge. And, and also we have an interstate bridge if people come and want to come from Washington to help us. Look at the age of these, of, of these bridges. They're all designed and built before 1990. They're questionable. Think about it. And also, the other thing I want to ask you is this. The steel bridge. Who uses steel bridge? Max line riders. If you want to go to the airport, oftentimes you take max line. If you want to go to the airport, you take Morgan Bridge. If these bridges down, what are you going to do? So we need to make sure that we need to identify critical lifeline in our region, and we need to spend money on those bridges. If we don't spread these bridges, spend money on those bridges and harden these bridges, what's going to happen to our, to our response? What's going to happen to our recovery? What's going to happen to our economy? Think about it. If, we, if, if you ask me where to spend the money, I will spend the money on those bridges right, right now. Next thing I want to talk about the port, port of Portland. Port of Portland, we are hoping that the, the port of Portland can, within 72 hours, people, the, if the out of state can want to help us, we want to make sure we can use the, our airport, right? To bring in emergency supplies. If I, if I airport, they could find some problem. Well, maybe we can use Hills, Hillsborough Airport. Well, what if something wrong with Hillsborough Airport? What are you going to do? Port of Portland, our Marine Port, is extremely vital for our economy. Brings a lot of uh, goods from overseas to here. And also, we bring a lot of uh, products we made in Oregon wine, agri agricultural products to overseas. If we lose our container crane, also, you may I, I stole this uh, slide from you, man. So I want to talk about this fuel at the uh, lower left corner. This fuel actually provides jet fuel for for for, uh, for PDX. If we lose this fuel farm, we're in trouble. And even if the, the fuel farm is okay, if our bridges has, if all of all these bridges collapsed, we cannot ship our goods from, we cannot take our products from, uh, on land at least, from, from, from fuel farm to PDX. We have a problem. Next, I want to talk about education, emergency facility, it's relevant for you guys. We have a K-12 uh, at, at the very top. You can see that uh, we have a construction boom in 1960. I want to let you know this. In the design codes, in the design code development in Oregon, we are, there's two milestones. 
Why is 1971 San Fernando earthquake? Okay. 1971 San Fernando earthquake is four years during those after uh, four years afterwards that earthquake. We 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 develop modern seismic code. Okay. So we have better understanding how to how to design our building better. At that time, we're still designing our building for lower seismicity. Right. Now, in 1994, we codified the effects of Cascadia subduction zone. From that moment, our, bridge, our, our buildings were designed properly to address proper hazard in our region. Building designed before 1994, they have problem. Well, if the building design happened before 1975, they are even worse. Because at, the, at that time, we engineered in the world. So, so let's look at the, our, our school buildings. We have a huge peak actually happened before 1975. Look at our fire station, police station, hospitals. We also have, have a big construction boom around the 1970. What does that mean? You, you want to, a lot of fire stations, they, 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 are, they won't perform well. And last piece for the community colleges. I know some of the community colleges, well, entire campus were built in 1970. 1975. Think about that campus. What does that mean? In, in Portland State University, we have a lot of old buildings built in that time. Okay. <clears throat> Our school, you know, the city of uh, uh, this, talking about and K 12 schools, we have a lot of old schools. Even in Portland School District, some of them are very old, 65 years old. They're designed. They design with no seismic consideration, and they are not they are the only enforcement or non doctor company thing. But I mentioned this: like, these buildings are killing people, or kill people inside the building. So, in the past 15 years, city of Portland has done has taken the leadership, retrofitting a lot of school, a lot of uh, not school, but a lot of fire stations, a lot of fire stations. They have gone multiple phases, evaluated the fire stations and uh, deal with these uh, seismic hazards. And also including also the, the Union Station as well. They in the process rush for the Union Station. But uh, I think the private sector, private building owner needs to follow their suit, also rush for their buildings. Because they know those buildings are dangerous. And also Oregon University System. Oregon University System has, 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 has established the seismic retrofit program in 2005. Um, the, the building is uh, the uh, sometimes with help from the state, sometimes with, with help from the from federal government. The building on the left side left side was 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 partially funded by FEMA. The building on the right hand side, you know that science building too was was funded by by uh, by the state. I have to say the Portland State University uh, people in the facility, I, they have very good vision. They want they want to solve the assignment problem, safety problem, and also. They care about sustainability. They typically they combine uh, infrastructure modernization together with seismic safety, and and make sure these buildings are sustainable and bring the green fish in, into the building. I think this is also set a good good example for within the zero format. Next piece I want to talk about water. And people say, well, we, we have water, lots of water in, from Columbia River, but I'm a river. Well, I, I'm not so sure because they have the uh, in a fuel tank next to the river, and if these tanks fail, then you know, we have environmental hazards. So, and the other thing is also I want to talk about is the uh, fire following earthquake. After earthquake, if you don't have automatic gas shutoff valve, your, your building may, 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 may catch on fire, right? Or if you, you notice fire, you want to call 911, your communication system is down, you cannot make that phone call. And then, Fire station got a phone call. They want to get out of the fire engine to help you, but the fire station door is jammed. They cannot get the fire engine out of the building. Well, now they are on the freeway, but everywhere, all the seats, all out of the cars, they're stuck. A bridge ahead of them crashed. And then, let's say even the fire engine reached their side to try to help you. Well, you know, sprinkler system in the building, but the water system is down. You don't have water to put out fire. What do you mean? In the past 15 years, city of Portland has done, I have to say, they have done uh, uh, significant work to improve our resilience of water system. 
uh, in Sandy River, they improved the, uh, um, the uh, they installed this underwater, under, under the river crossing project. So make sure the water supply can be safely um, cross the cross the Sandy River area. And then the, I believe the city also is in the process of building a new reservoir, okay, a covered reservoir in the uh, Powell Butte area. Well, water, so far so good, and the water now has reached the river, reached the eastern bank of the river. We have some river crossing. We have a little fiber soil, and it, some of the pipes may not work well. So we really have some water problem in the city. The other thing I want to move back a little bit. Also on the west side, we have uh, high-tech firms over there. These are the, our economic engine, economic base. If Intel doesn't have water, if Genentech doesn't have water, what's going to happen to their business? Think about it. This piece is the, uh, I'll show this photo I want to, because I know Liam Kaplan will be here today. So I want to show this slide. Liam Kaplan, he's, he's, a, he's a chief engineer with EPA. EPA has done a wonderful job in the past 15 years, hauling their substations and boating down their electrical equipment. I think the private, private utility companies need to follow their suit and also part of their, 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 their facility as well. Granted, you know, as you mentioned, there are some, there are still some work in progress, such as the transmission tower next to the So, <clears throat> over the past 10 years, the state of Oregon has made tremendous progress, but we're still not there yet. I'm not going to read all of these things. But uh, I want to point out is in starting in 2007, the, the uh, 2005 actually, the state passed four bills. They want to retrofit school buildings, emergency facilities, and also hospitals. And you know, during the economic downturn, in, even in 2009, the state uh, spent $30 million to help retrofit the schools and emergency facilities. This year, our legislative assembly passed the resilience planning for, for our state. In two years, we will develop a resilience planning and make recommendations to the government, the legislative assembly, to make our state very resilient. So, overall, roadmap down the road for the future. How do we make our building more resilient? First of all, first of all, I think we want to make sure that our engineers clearly communicate with the building owner. Let them know what kind of performance the building is designed for. If the owner knows the performance the building is designed for, they may change their mind. The second piece is that we need to continue to refine and improve our code based on lessons learned from the earth space. Okay. And also we need to give some incentive for people to build a uh, building for high performance level. If you have a condo building, well, develop a design building and you sell it and they walk away. There's no incentive. If we give them some incentive, that means they're something better. Then maybe that's something we need to think about. For the existing building, we need to retrofit all these uh, critical facilities. We need to mitigate the seismic risk associated with uh, these killer buildings, unreinforced masonry buildings, and uh, non tactical concrete, concrete buildings. Especially these concrete frame buildings will affect larger population. Okay. Lifeline. Lifeline is very complicated because it's a huge network. We have to work together, work, work with the different counties, different cities, working all together to bring the, make sure this entire network is redundant, will we'll perform well after doing the earthquake. So I think at the state level, I think we need to have a so-called technical lifeline technical council. We need to audit every single lifeline sec uh, sector. Make sure that, understand where they are, doing the assessment evaluation. Once we know where they are, then we can, we can, we can, we can plan for that. We can mitigate the, the hazard, the risk associated with that. So we, we, we need to do all of that. And, and then, then when we, last piece is we have to, uh, we have to uh, the, uh, get a national level code standards to make sure that all the new life by design they will perform well. Uh, they will meet the, our regional resilience goal. Because there are many sectors, water, wastewater, and they are self, they are self regulated. They don't need different uh, cities, different uh, areas, they use different standards. And we, we need to, at a federal level, we need to have this uh, 
standards a set of standards formal standards so that uh, state level we can work together meet you know, meet our standards so that we can bring in the life of the entire On the right hand side is the uh, is current status. On the left hand side, that's the goal we want to we want to go to. Okay. I'm going to stop right there.